mistakes Etsy sellers make that may destroy your Etsy shop. Now, this is not just a generic list of the mistakes you can make. This is the mistakes that I made so I can share with you. Basically, I was going through my past listings, my expired listings, everything I'd sold, and I realized I could look back right until the start, back in time to 2008 when I started. And it was like a who's who of what not to do on Etsy. And I thought, hey, this is such a good idea to share my little walkthrough with you of the mistakes Etsy sells make and I know because I made them. First mistake was impatience. This is the same for just about everybody. You start on Etsy and you think if you list it they will come. If you create your listings people will immediately come along. Literally I was putting up listings and looking for every day going it's not sold, it's not sold, it's not sold. I needed to calm down. It takes longer than that. So the next mistake I did was I freaked out. I decided that obviously I wasn't getting sales because my prices were too high and I dropped and I dropped my prices. Then finally on the 15th of August, I got that first sale. But the thing is, I dropped my prices so much it was just over a fiver for that cat, which Okay, looking at it, it's not the best quality. But if we take into the account the materials, the time, my time to make that cat, my time to learn to make that cat, and also the time on Etsy listing, photographing, all the good stuff. I was literally not making any money at all on that cat. Was it worth it for me to work for that stranger to make that cat? No, probably not. And as I just mentioned, basically the skill level, the quality of that cat, I made a huge mistake, which was I learned about needle felting and within a couple of weeks I was trying to sell pretty much because the thing was I learned about this new craft, it seemed fun and everything and then I looked online at the prices that people were selling them for and I thought, wow, look at that, I could make a fortune. What I didn't take into account was some of these people had been doing this for years, they'd built up a skill level. My skill level was beginner, it was pre-beginner. I was rock bottom. And so many of us make this mistake. Some people will have gone to art school, they'll have been painting for years, they'll, they'll have learnt all the things. And then we come along and buy a beginner art kit and think we can sell stuff for the same amount of money. Our skill level isn't the same. And this isn't just the skill in creating the item, it's the skill and understanding of the materials. We might know we might not know what light fast pigments are. We might not know how to fix or mount a work of art. We might not know how our stuff's going to last over time. These are important quality factors. And yeah, while we're talking quality, yeah, my skill level in photography, not great at that time. The worst one, I'd heard people say you had to use a light box and in my head, I thought they just meant a box. So random photographs in a dark old box. It's too dark, it's too contrasty. The background of that box is too distracting. And also, I mean, you can see I was trying to learn. I was taking advice from people. So I'd put something in there for scale. It was a 50 pence piece. Etsy was huge in America and barely known in the UK. So me putting a very UK based item of currency in there for people to be able to tell scale really wasn't going to help a whole lot, especially because our 50p pieces are a random size compared to every other coin. And look at this photograph here in my hand in a dark room, just with a messy couch in the background and my dog blurry running past. Wow, I thought up that photograph well. These photographs didn't give anyone any chance to fall in love with my items. Beautiful photographs, it seems like a strange thing to be banging on about, but they're all that the customer sees and you just don't get to fall in love with the items if the photograph's blurry, distracting or unpleasant to look at. And looking at my first sale, I can see how terrible my SEO was at the time. Now, in 2008, Etsy SEO was a different different animal than it is now. But still, needle felted to kitten. That title is succinct and to the point. And look at all those one word tags. I did not have a clue what was going on. And worse, not just how I'm describing the item to eat seat, but at the time just about no one knew what, knew what needle felting was. So nobody was going to be searching for a needle felted kitten. So yeah, SEO, 
terrible. For those that don't know, you can use tools or even ask your friends or use the search bar on Etsy to get an idea of the terms that actual buyers are searching for. In my case, with that needle felted sculpture, I might have been wanting to look for a market for memorial cat sculptures or certain breeds of animals. I really wanted to think like a buyer and figure out. And then when you decide to explain it to Etsy, your titles have to have those most important terms that you've discovered that people are searching for. And then those have to match up in your tags. You have to put phrases in your tags that match up with your title to back it up and say, this is what my item really is. I have loads more videos on how to SEO stuff, but just, just a reminder if you're new. Oh, oh, and my next sold items, the next few sold items, that reminds me of such a big mistake. This is talking about items that you cannot sell on Etsy. So, as we say, I was panicking, I was slashing my prices, I was saying, why am I not getting sales? I was desperate. I have to be 100% honest here. I started a shop. Another mistake Etsy makers make. I was desperate for money. I was not making enough money to live off and I was really struggling. So I was desperate to make sales. So I was desperate to do the things that brought the customers in. I thought if I got the ball rolling with a raffle to give away money to charity, that would at least drive interest to my shop that would build it up and I would be able to make some sales that brought money to me. There's a few issues with this. First is gambling laws. They're different all over the world and a raffle is gambling in many countries. So yeah, probably shouldn't have even been holding a raffle. But also in Etsy rules, you have to have something physical. Your customer has, ha, has to get something when they purchase. So just saying a chance to win a raffle wasn't good enough. So Etsy actually caught this one after a while and quite a number of sales and they took this down and told me it was incorrect. So I reworked the listing and instead of being a raffle, I did a thing that was a chance to donate to shelter dogs and the people when they donated, when they when they bought my listing, they got a PDF showing rescue dogs in a rescue that I was getting the money for, the dogs before they were adopted and after they were adopted. So they were getting a little something to see what they were donating their money to. Still, this is me grasping at straws to try and get sales. This was not me selling the things that were relevant to what I was selling. Okay, it was drawing in dog lovers. There was a kind of bit of a good idea there, drawing in dog lovers, which is who I wanted to sell to. But this was not what I was wanting to base my shop on. So not a great strategy either there. Yeah, and oh, oh, and speaking of things that you can't sell on Etsy, Jack Skellington. I was so proud of him. He was lovely and he went to a great customer. We had lovely conversation. I still should not have been selling that on Etsy. I didn't know at the time. But copyright items, IP infringing, basically characters from someone else's stuff. You can't make that and sell it. I was lucky that they didn't catch me for that, but here is one that they did. This item has been deactivated by Etsy. And it's a shame this was my stupidity. I was just working on making characters. I wanted to learn and prove my skill making faces and things. So I was inspired to make a little blue man just out of my head. I wasn't copying anything. Just kind of inspired by a Scottish Celtic. Celtic folklore and stuff and I made this little blue man and when I made him at the time I'd been reading one of the Terry Pratchett books that had a character Magna Fiegel in it and well characters um, and I just put that in the title I thought that was cool that they were kind of like inspired by each other yeah again can't do that <laughs> the the estate of Terry Pratchett spotted that told Itzy and Itzy took that item down so although my character was not actually based on any of those things I should not have used the name I could have reworked the title and put him up for sale again but I decided it wasn't worth messing about with I had already got in trouble for this character Let's just put it down to experience. So here's a good example of making new listings when I didn't have to. Now I'm starting to get a bit of attention. This is mainly because on Etsy I'm busy in the forums and things. And as I said, the, the Etsy SEO, how to get seen on Etsy was a very different animal. Basically, if you posted up something new, 
it was going to hit the front page for a very short time at least. If you were in the forums or in the chat, people would see you and often people bought from people they were chatting with. So I started to get customers and they were approaching me for custom work. But what I did was each time someone approached me for custom work, I made them a new order specifically for themselves. And I shouldn't have done that. If I'd have just had, as I do now, a custom listing that the person buys and then we go into all the customising it for them. If I'd have just had that and every time they purchased, I relisted, then that builds up a quality score with Etsy. Etsy starts to know and trust and say, hang on, that listing has been great when dog lovers buy it, so let's show it to some more dog lovers. I really do seem to be getting a little bit better. It looks like I've purchased a light box, but there's a few mistakes here. Firstly, not enough light. This was just a simple fabric light box. They don't come with light built in. Some, some do, but these ones didn't come with light built in. The fabric around it diffuses the light. So if you shine other light into it, it diffuses it and it looks lovely. But you have to actually add some light. Whether that's natural light through a window or you get different kind of lights, generally photography does require a fair bit of light and no editing. No decent photographer just takes their image right off the camera. I know it seems like a tedious extra step, but you do need to edit ever so slightly. Even in videos, if I didn't color grade, if I didn't sort out the colors for my videos, I would look fairly dull. You have to edit the colors to make them more true to life. That's just how a camera works. It's not quite like your eyeball. It needs a bit of help. And another huge one is, um, yeah, not making sure I'd white balanced. Even before you're thinking of editing, you want to make sure that the original picture, the, the raw picture you take on your, cam on your camera is actually reasonable. And in this case with this cat, I hadn't white balanced it at all, which just means telling your camera that this bit of white, this is what white looks like. So can we match all the colors to that kind of thing? You can see this poor cat, the background, which was a white light tent. Looks like it's on a pink background. And the final one there is the timestamp on the images. Now this isn't a massive deal, but I have had some listings that have been up for over 10 years because the pictures just worked. I just hit something right. And if I'd have had a timestamp saying that was taken 10 years ago, that's really gonna put people off. If I don't put the timestamp on it, then I can reuse the photographs. Also, they really are kind of ugly. Okay, now I feel I'm getting a little bit better with these agility dog shots. They're actually quite fun, especially that image of Scamp, the weaving dog. Although that brings me to another mistake, naming them. Naming him Scamp. Who's searching for Scamp the weaving dog? It is definitely cute and some artists might do this, but don't make it your whole focus. I do see some, some artists specifically as their title will put the title of their artwork, which makes sense, you would have that at the gallery. So, you know, Tranquility or some kind of abstract name. Sounds great, but your title is your real estate for your SEO. So you have to say what your item is in your title, not that abstract name that you gave your item. I still looking back though, I do kind of like giving them names like that. It does add a personal element and, a single word's not going to kill my SEO, so I actually might do that again. But for 2008, nearly 30 orders in my very first year, that's not too bad. It's not as bad as I thought, although quite a few of those sales were problematic. So looking through some more, there is yet yeah, more copyright issues. Pam still hasn't learnt. Oh, and check out this red fox. This is a great example of thinking about what your thumbnails look like. Because of the aspect ratio I took this picture in, when it went on to Etsy, they cropped that main thumbnail that people all see. So you're not really getting a great view of the fox. I could have edited the picture. I don't remember if that was still available at the time, but I could have slid that fox up or down to frame it a little better. But it's really worth thinking of what the thumbnail is going to look like. And if you're not shooting in the same aspect ratio as the thumbnail, perhaps don't zoom in quite so tight so you've got the option to fit your entire listing or the most important bit of your item in that thumbnail. And now it looks like in my shop, I'm experimenting with different types of photography and different different backgrounds. 
I even, because I was making very tiny sculptures, I'm experimenting with some doll's house props as well. I know people say that your shop should have a cohesive look, so would consider this a mistake, but personally, I see this as great. I was experimenting to see what worked with people. In the end, I ended up with a white background. It's not the best, but it works really well, and things like photographing outside, I could get some beautiful images on just the perfect day. But I live in Scotland, we don't have the perfect day very often. We have whole months of winter where it barely seems to get bright at all, and then other seasons where it's completely raining for whole chunks of time. So I just could not make all my listings in my shop have an outdoor background because I need to be able to photograph at any time. So that is where it's easier to control a background if I'm using the same lights in the same light tent in the same location. That way I can have a cohesive look. And I see another mistake here with Buster, this dog that I created and he sold, so I clearly made another one very similar. But I just made another listing. Like I mentioned previously with my custom listings, I should have, if I was just making a dog that was almost identical to the one I'd already made, I should have just relisted that listing and changed the photographs. Again, helps the SEO a little bit. And then we get to 2010. Here I had my best idea. I dreamt it up, my splat bookmarks, and immediately they did well. I just mentioned on Facebook to my friends that I'd made this and people were wanting to buy. They thought it was fantastic. I popped it up on Etsy. This is the thing that got shared, that got on the front page of Etsy. This is the thing that people, re it really resonated with them. And it took me over two years to find this item that was so good. And when we look, I mean, my SEO is terrible. I don't even say that it's a bookmark, but it was good enough. People saw it and they fell in love with it. And I totally did the right thing here. I doubled down. I made more animal bookmarks like this. I even took feedback from customers, customers when they asked if I could do a squirrel, a rabbit, a horse, or more importantly, when they asked if I could do a black cat. So bear in mind what your customers are saying. Those questions can really help you fine tune your listings. The black cat that a customer asked me for has been my number one since 2010. The absolutely biggest mistake that I made comes up now in 2010. And this is the thing that nearly killed my shop. This is the thing that I nearly quit Etsy for. And I'd been bubbling along. I thought I knew what I was doing. I kept on doing the same things, but the sales were drying up. Like, not even drying up. The sales had switched off. And I continued doing what I was doing, doing it more, doing more, bigger of what I was doing, but not really changing anything. And what had happened was, in 2010, Etsy very much changed their algorithm. Not what people are saying nowadays, saying Etsy's changed the algorithm. It hasn't. They're tweaking it. It hasn't changed. But there was a massive change. And my mistake was I did not keep up to date with this. I was not keeping an eye on the forums. I was not listening to influencers. I was not reading announcements. And I didn't realize what had changed. I was not alone at this point. But there was such a huge change and it switched sales off for many of us. So it is super important. Hopefully Etsy won't make another massive change like this. And the changes they are making, like when they talk about the star seller or free shipping and all this, don't freak out and change everything to try and jump on these things just in case. You want to look at them and see if they're relevant for you, be aware of what changes are coming, and if everything falls, if your shop totally fails, and it's not a coincidence just because it's summer and everybody's sales are a bit lower, but if you see a real, real change due to a change that Etsy's made and you know what that change is, then it is worth experimenting with some listings to see if following what they've told you to do does help. But don't knee jerk, but also don't have your head in the sand. If what you were doing doesn't work anymore, stop doing what you were doing. Oh, this Welsh Springer Spaniel, this totally reminds me of another mistake. If you're going to do custom work, and I know a lot of people don't like it, but I will say, if you can and you're up for it, custom work is great. But do not make the item before the customer has placed the order. Put your money up front. This customer was actually a friend of mine, well, was someone I knew th through Facebook, but they requested this custom order. They put up pictures of their dog everywhere. I worked to try and get it 
perfect. This is a, a showing person, so they know all the confirmation points in their breed. So I worked super hard to make it perfect. They loved it. They put my pictures up all over social media saying, look, here's my felty dog. How amazing this is. Everyone said it was the best thing. When I came to get payment from them, no, nope, they didn't. They couldn't buy it anymore. They'll buy it later. They'll buy it later. At the end of the day, I had to sell that to somebody else later. And I was lucky that it was generic enough for the breed that the person was able to see their own dog in it. But if you're doing very customized stuff, if the customer doesn't buy it, then most of the time you won't be able to sell it to someone else. And that's not fair on you. And I get what you're saying. You don't want to put the customer off because they don't know, you know, they don't want to be tied into buying something and then they might not like it. Well, you can always offer refunds, offer them guarantees if they don't like it. But if they don't purchase it first, then they don't necessarily have decided that they want to buy something. They're just thinking it's a kind of good idea and they'll get you to do all the work and then they'll be like, do you know, actually I've changed my mind or I asked four other people to do it as well and I like Susan's better. So get the money up front. This gets them on your waiting list and then you can dedicate the time to them and they've already paid. Oh, more copyright things. It took me a long time to figure out this copyright thing. Um, but I, I think I've got it now. So what I've learned on my over a decade on Etsy is you're not going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes, but keep on learning, experimenting and trying to improve and nothing you do so long as you're not so bad as to get your shop shut down. But otherwise, nothing you can do is going to permanently kill your shop. I made so many mistakes, but I was able to fix them. I was able to change them. I was able to adapt and overcome and grow my shop. So don't think you've you've failed already. You certainly haven't. If you keep going, you keep trying to get better, you can totally do well, even if you've had mistakes.